So I'm Kent Weigel. I'm a Chair of Animal and Dairy Sciences here at UW-Madison and also on the Madison Steering Committee and the Advisory Council. So the Steering Committee kind of manages the hub aspects of UW-Madison. There's one of the, each campus and then the Advisory Council takes a broader view and includes a lot of industry folks. So uh, each speaker in this session will have about 25 minutes and then uh, we'll hold all the questions till the end and we'll have about 30 minutes if they stay on time for discussion and Q&A and so we'll have online and in-person questions. So if you're in person, we'll just bring around a microphone. We'll bring all the speakers up front so they can use this one. And if you're online, just type your question in chat uh, with a Q and a, uh, some, a colon in front of it, and uh, Cara will read those questions. So um, with that, I'll introduce our uh, first speaker. Joao Doria is a assistant professor in precision ag and data analytics. And Joao has a, uh, did his PhD and spent two years after that working for DSM, uh, animal health and nutrition company working in Latin America on dairy and beef operations. Also did uh, a postdoc here, a couple of those, and developed a lot of expertise in data analytics, sensor technology, artificial intelligence, computer vision, related areas, and has been with us uh, broadly for about five years and two years as a faculty member. So yeah, come on up, Joao. Hello everyone, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ken, for the introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, show a little bit of the data that we are generating with uh, the Dairy Innovation Hub uh, support. Uh, it's a CO uh, preliminary data, so we will finish that in June um, next year. And, but it's some, uh, somehow exciting uh, information that we are collecting from that project. And the project is around, around using computer vision systems and trying to uh, early detect healthy issues in, in dairy cows and hopefully create a model to monitor that better and improve health and welfare in the long term. So that's, that's the idea uh, in this project. So we have as the co-investigators in this project and we are having a lot of support given the size of the data sets that we have and the demand that we have from high throughput computing. Um, Miron Livini from Computer Science and Brian Bokman, they are giving a lot of priority in our analysis and um, we need to acknowledge them on how we need to run these large data sets. They are helping us a lot with, uh, with our research. And uh, this uh, research is, is supporting Dario Oliveira, that he's the postdoc working this project, but because of the COVID, uh, Dario couldn't come, so he was working remote. And then these two guys here, they started working a lot in this project and um, they need to be mentioned. Tiago is a postdoc in my lab, and Rafael is a PhD student, and Caleb is an undergrad that also leveraged the data that we collect. Uh, right now, Caleb uh, is uh, working in the industry with data science, but those guys, they leverage the project, the data that we collect here, and started working different applications, not only what was proposed here in this, uh, in this research. So um, the main idea of this project is how we can solve somehow or how we can early detect issues that happen for cows, for lactating dairy cows, uh, during the transition period, given that this period is responsible for seven, uh, 67 to 70 percent of the total disease that is happening in metabolic disorder in dairy cows, right? So if you don't know what the transition period is, I'll quickly introduce that to you here. So after calving, the cow will have a peak of production, of milk production, but the peak of intake will happen later, so that uh, unbalance here generates what we call negative energy balance, so the cow needs more energy to supply milk production than the cow is eating, and so the cow starts mobilizing body reserves, and then usually body fat, and that high rate of mobilization, if that's too severe, this can lead to a lot of metabolic uh, issues of peripartum disorders like ketosis, hip hypocalcemia, uh, retained placenta, metritis, and the metritis and others. So what I try to do is try to act uh, with sensing technology around this period here and see if we can early detect those issues so then we could create um, strategies to mitigate that type of problem. Okay. So if you look to the, the cost associated with those problems during transition period, and those are uh, recent, uh, fairly recent data, 
you can see that it is around $200, $200, $300, 500 depends on the type of the disorder that you have. And then a clinical case of ketosis, it can go up to $1,600, right? So that's it's very significant. And, and if we can minimize some of those healthy issues, we can potentially reduce the economical loss uh, related to those issues, right? So that cost is usually associated with the treatment cost uh, and the impact that the disease have, uh, has on the productive and reproductive performance of the cow. And we also have an impact here related to increased culling rate. So um, a lot of decisions in terms of culling an animal will be also related to that animal that is getting sick during that first lactation. So if you're investing a lot of money to raise a heifer that will become a cow, and this animal gets sick, so then you're not harvesting back the money that you invest to raise that animal because you decide to cool that animal given the, the, you know, the, the problems or the health issues that the animal is developing very early in lactation. So what do we try to do? Well, we try to manage uh, the risk of the animal developing that, that problem. And in our case, the metabolic issues we are looking at related to body fat mobilization. So we have uh, usually body conditioning score be monitoring farms and you use that as a tool to access, I mean, to, to evaluate what the risk of the animal being calved, uh, to calve with specific you know, body composition and how this would increase that risk. So this is commonly used, but it's really hard to do that frequently, systematically, every day, every cow. So this is, is very difficult. So the idea, oops, is how we can automate that process and actually move from body condition score and get a measurement that's more precise or more you know, um, directly quantified. So, as I mentioned, this, the, the body condition score is somehow subjective. So, you have a cow that is 3, a uh, nice scale uh, from 1 to 5. Let's say you have a cow that is 2.5, another cow is 3. And for some people, this cow will look 2.5, and for other people, this cow will look 3. So, we have always this confusion, especially if you go for 0.25 uh, scale. So, then, you know, you, you have 3.25 and then it's, it's even more difficult to agree sometimes between uh, trained evaluators, right? So here, for example, is the data from our trial. We have that cow 21 days before calving, and we have the same cow 14 days before calving, and three trained evaluators gave the body condition score four for that cow, and for four for that cow, but the same cow, different time points, right? But when you get the 3D image and you overlay the image, you, you can see that the volume, well, the cow loses body tissue. The cow, you, you can see that the size or the amount of tissue in the cow is not the same in different regions here. So we start to notice that the volume of the cows is changing in different time points when the body condition score was not changing. So the point here is how we can be more precise computing things as volume, area, shape descriptors, and other measurements that will better quantify the condition of the animal and not using a combination uh, of features, as you can see here, to, to characterize what the composition of the animal is. So the idea here is, is be more precise and somehow reduce the subjectivity related to even a trained evaluator. Okay? So the goal of this project is, is not only related to the body condition score and how monitoring body condition, body shape, we help us predict uh, some disease, but also how we can integ integrate that information with behavior, given that the cow is stopping eating uh, after calving, and that dropping intake can also be observed with eating times, number of visits at the feed bank. So how we can combine behavior information with body tissue mobilization, and then try to create analytical tools that will early uh, identify animals with a high risk of being sick. So we started developing a framework to automatically collect data because we have uh, a trial. It's a trial in collaboration with HED. HED is a, is a collaborator in this project. Uh, and in that trial, we had uh, more than 100 cows going to the milking parlor every day, twice a day. And the one thing that we imagine is that a farmer, for us, we cannot go every day and collect data with this camera. We need to automate that process of data collection if we want to use this in large scale. So we have that small camera. We have four of those 
mountain at uh, Arlington, at the exit of the milking parlor. So every time the animal is passing through the lane after milking, we collect a sequence of images of uh, infrared, which is this grayscale image, and a deaf image, which we can have a 3D representation for that uh, animal here. So to do that automation, uh, we set up a, a pipeline of data analysis in the cloud. So every time the cow is coming through the milking parlor and we acquire those images, we send that information to the cloud. And once that image hit the cloud, a sequence of automations or of models are called to make inference and then starting the process of the image. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is to separate what is good and bad image. So this is a, an automation that is done, well, we are trying to automate that process so it means we do not restrain the animal. The animal is walking as usual. So you're going to have images like that. And the way the camera is working, the camera is calculating the distance from, what, what the, uh, from, from the camera to the floor. So when that distance change, it's because the cow is passing through. And you get a sequence of images. In that sequence, you see images like this. So we train first uh, a convolutional neural network to separate what is a good image from a bad image. And then we only select a, a good image to follow the, the next step, to go to the next step. So if the image is good, then we apply another neural network that we segment the image and remove all the background. So now we have only the body of the cow. And then after doing this, we apply that thing that we call mask uh, into a infrared image, that grayscale. So now we have the cow in a grayscale image without the background. And then you have your deaf image without the background. So now it's much clean, organized, and now you can analyze the data for what we, we need to analyze. In this case, we are using that image for animal identification, and we are using this image initially for body condition score, okay, as a case. So we have that two uh, less models, one for identification, the other for body condition score, but we could use that information, that image for any other uh, prediction. It could be body weight, it could be things that we are working now, I will show you. So that first step was very nice, so we have this, this pipeline automated, and now we can plug different models for different phenotypes, since we can collect data from 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, no matter the number of cows that are passing here, we just need to um, have internet access, actually, to have this running, because this is a cloud-based uh, development. So if you think about what's the accuracy to identify those animals, uh, in that group, a specific group of cows of six animals, we achieve an accuracy of 94% accuracy, uh, average accuracy to identify animals based on the black and white, the coat color pattern um, of the animals. For the body condition score, we achieve 71% accuracy. And it seems if you, if you treat body condition score as a categorical variable, if you treat that number as a continuous variable, so then the mean absolute error to, to predict that body condition is 0 0.20. So that 71%, it's, it's actually very similar. Uh, if you go in the literature, there are several papers published with predicting body condition score, you see very similar results. So the question here is why you did body condition score if there are several papers published with body condition score? You don't have to prove that anymore. Well, there was a proof as a case study for the automation as one of the phenotypes. Uh, but what we are interested in is how we can use that information and not only have body condition score, but have a better prediction uh, of body composition. So that was our next step, uh, thinking about how we can eliminate the subjectivity of the measurement, of the score, because when we look to the 71% body condition score, we need to remember that this was training given a score of humans, and it can be biased uh, somehow. There is an error that we cannot eliminate. So every time you train an algorithm based uh, with a human gold standard of base, you can have that, that issue. So the question is how you can eliminate that subjectivity and go to measurements as volume, shapes, and forms, and geometric features that you can extract from the image. Okay? Uh, so what we're doing now, we are using pre uh image, 3D image, in different time points, 21, 14, and 7 days. We have images, and we are processing that now after Kevin as well. And after Kevin, actually, we have daily images. Before Kevin, we only have those three data points, 21, 14, and 7. And we have 27,000 uh, images, top-down view, 
only that type of view you see here. And uh, we collect the health issues related to uh, subclinical ketosis from the dairy comp. And we also recently uh, got the negative energy balance uh, measured through, we are using plasma NIFA uh, greater than 600 mil equivalents as our criteria to classify a cow that is under negative energy balance, okay? We know that uh, for subclinical ketosis, the health events of dairy comp must not be the most accurate uh, measurement, but we are finishing uh, that analysis for blood BHB and we have th those things confirmed. But in any case, we have plasma NIFA, which is a good indicator as well. So what we are doing is we are using this image in the prepartum, and we are trying to predict the health issue happening the first 14 days after calving. And they try to predict the health problem and also the negative energy balance would indicate some risk as well. Okay? So note that this is a very difficult uh, analytical uh, problem because our last data point came seven days before Kevin, and the closest one, if we have any uh, healthy event, we will come in the day one. So we have at least the minimal eight days gap between your last image and your healthy event. So if something happened the day 10, then you have 17 days, and that's the distance that you have between your last image and your event. So it's a super early prediction, uh, given what we have published in the literature, and so you know, something uh, easy to accomplish, especially considering that you only have a 3D image in that case here. So what are we doing? I, I mentioned about the body condition score, so what we're trying to do is calculate the volume of the body, area, and the mask, which is the number of pixels related to, to, to uh, animal body, which is very correlated area as well. And we are generating those three measurements, those three features, and we are using a, the training uh, convolution neural network that we train for body condition score. But instead of having the body condition score here, we are interested in what the, the neural network is looking in terms of shape and we're extracting the features before that prediction of body condition score. Only the features related to the body shape of the animal. And we are using these 1024 features and combining these with these three <coughs> biological features because we understand what volume is, but we do not understand what the computer is extracting in terms of features. That's why we're calling these here computational features. And we are combining those. And for each time point, we have a vector of 1027 features. So one for 20, 21, 14, 7 days. And then we are extracting those features and using these in two different analytical approach. One uh, is a decision tree, gradient boosting decision tree, and the other one is partially square, uh, the discriminant analysis. And we divide in training tests and repeat this 10 times, and we select the hyperparameters of those algorithms using the training test, uh, the, the train set. And then we predict negative energy balance uh, if it's greater uh, 600 mil equivalents or, or not and the case of subclinical ketones, right? And what we found was a precision of 0.64, recall 0.87, F1 score of 0.73, and for ketones, 0.75 precision, 0.91 recall, and F1 score of 0.75. So what that means quickly is that if you have 100 cows, and if you know that 40 will get sick, what the model is doing is telling that 36 from the, this, this pool of 40, we're going to be able to detect that b before uh, Kevin. We still need to work uh, and improve the precision because the precision are the misclassification in terms of cows that we are telling that will get sick, but the cows will not get sick. So you will have extra check if we use the model as it is now, but you will not have cows that you get sick you don't know that you get sick. Right? So for the problems that you might have, this is the less problematic, I would say. Um, and so what we need to remember here is that from those analyses, we are only using 3D image for only three time points. So we have data after Kevin, all image, day before of the, the metabolic issue. We have the, the data, the cow information, the diet, the computer vision for the behavior. We didn't use any yet. You are only using three single data points for each cow, that we are not even treat, treating these as dependent in time. We are treating these as independent because the series is super small. We only have three data points. Okay. So we are very excited with this, um, 
this, uh, this idea and with the possibility of integrating the other computer vision and improve the prediction quality uh, as we uh, finish and, and move for the next phase now uh, of the project. So what we have done so far, and I will briefly uh, show you uh, this, we're still working on that data because this is the most complicated data to work with, is how we integrate all the cameras, all the views from several panes uh, to extract the behavior information. So the way we're treating that problem here is we are doing some sort of hierarchical analysis. So first, we count the number of animals in each area that we have interest, drinking, lying. So if all animals are lying down, so there is no need for identification, okay? So all animals are lying down for that period of time. All animals are eating, no need for identification too. But if you have a situation like that, so then you need some animals are lying, some animals are standing uh, or eating, then you need to identify the individual and then classify the behavior uh, given which, where the animal is and what, how, what the posture of the animal. So this reduces a lot the size, the size of the problem and the amount of analysis that needs to be run in this huge data set. So what we started doing here, and instead of analyzing the entire data set, we are getting a section uh, of the animals that are lying here, and we are building a 1D signal. And this 1D signal, uh, that is the average of that section, that pretty much get a piece of the animal that's lying. And this is the target, or the response variable in this case, would be the number of cows that are lying here. So we have one signal related to that, uh, the number of cows that are lying. And then we have this for zero cows, five cows. So we train a 1D convolutional neural network, and the target is the, what this will be predicting, the number of cows that are lying uh, in that uh, in the bed. So if you look at the confusion matrix, you see that that strategy is working very well. We have an overall accuracy of 84% to detect animals that are uh, lying. So with that, we eliminate a huge part of the data because we know when all animals were aligned and we don't have to identify those. So that's how we are moving now. So what you want to do with the, the image that we need to identify is then identifying the animals that are, for example, eating, and then we know the rest that are lying, we know the IDs. So we don't have to identify every single animal in the pen. Um, so our idea in the end of the behavior is that we can have uh, all the locations computed for the, those animals and all the identification for each respective location associated with the posture. And then we, we will know eating time, drinking time, aligning time for every single cow. And you have the body condition information or the 3D image that we're going to couple. And with that, finalize the predictions uh, related to body tissue mobilization or ketosis and uh, negative energy balance using a plasma neutron. So our next step is continue um, that project in terms of analysis. We have more data to collect to increase the size of the data set uh, in terms of number of cows. Uh, we still need to uh, finalize some blood samples. Um, we have very good collaboration with Heather in this trial, and we are working together uh, on that blood analysis and the disease uh, detection. Uh, we still need to finalize the predictive models for negative energy balance. We still need to do body weight. We have the weights of all those animals and finish uh, the behavior. So by the end, by the middle of next year, all of these will be done. We are good um, in time. Our timeline looks uh, good for this project. And, and so we will be able to integrate body shape and behavior and uh, hopefully make better prediction here. Well, thank you very much. I, I think I'm, I was in time time, right? Yeah, yeah, so thank you. Very good. Thanks, Joel. Uh, we, are, we are seeing the future uh, going on right now. And uh, I'm Victor Cabrera. I'm in the Department of Animal and Dairy Sciences uh, here at UW-Madison. And I'm also part of the uh, steering committee of the Dairy Innovation Hub. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce my esteemed colleague here, uh, Jennifer Van Oz. And let me tell you a little bit more about her, uh, herself. Uh, she's an assistant professor and extension specialist in animal welfare on the faculty of the Department of Animal and Dairy Sciences at UW-Madison. 
Research in her lab focuses on understanding, evaluating, and improving the welfare of dairy animals from biological and so on social sciences perspectives. So please help me to welcome Jennifer Vanos. Thank you so much, Victor, for the introduction, and as well as for adjusting the microphone to my height. I appreciate that. <laughs> So I just want to start off by introducing some terminology here. So I'm going to talk about animal welfare primarily, but I think it's important to actually take a step back and define animal care because these terms are sometimes used interchangeably, but animal care is everything that we as humans do and provide to the animals. And then animal welfare is one of those outcomes that result from animal care. So if we think about what we provide to the animals, that includes their housing environments and facilities, the management practices and husbandry practices that we use, and also the direct handling practices we use when we move them. And all of these things affect what the animal experiences. So these various outcomes can include the animal's health status, their welfare, which includes but is not limited to health, and other things like performance, production, reproduction, etc. So all of these outcomes can range on a spectrum from poor to good or somewhere in between. So what we try to do in my lab is we primarily focus on welfare and we want to understand how these animal care factors lead to poor or good welfare outcomes so that we can then establish best management practices and then extend that to the industry. So a large part of my job is that I'm an extension specialist. So I work with dairy farmers as well as their supporting advisors such as their veterinarians, other extension educators, consultants, nutritionists, et cetera. So I want to make sure that the research I do is very applicable to the dairy industry, which is in the spirit of the Dairy Innovation Hub. Um, so there are a lot of different topics that I work on in my lab. So a few topics around the social dynamics of resource use, which I will go into today, as well as thermal comfort for both calves and lactating cows. That includes heat stress and cold stress. And then I have a lot of topics related specifically to calf welfare, especially around social contact for pre weaned calves. I've also branched out into the social science and farm management side. Um, due to popular demand from dairy producers in Wisconsin, I have several grant projects focused on providing effective training resources so that people who work with cows use positive behaviors when they interact with them. And then lastly, as I alluded to, I want to make sure that this research is applicable to farms. So in research settings, we can assess all of these various outcomes relating to welfare, but in practical on-farm settings that can be challenging, how do we do this with time and labor constraints to understand how we can capture a snapshot of the welfare status of cows on working farms? So today I will be focusing on examples of the first two. I have two PhD students in my lab who are carrying out work under those topic areas. So as I alluded to earlier, scientific research in animal health and welfare can help inform best practices or standards for the industry. And we can use a combination of different types of outcome measures in these experiments. So traditionally in animal science, of course, we want to look at these production and performance outcomes. We can also examine markers of the underlying physiological mechanisms. And then my training is in animal behavior, and I think that this provides an opportunity to do what I call giving the animal a voice. So if we're clever, we can phrase the question in a way that allows the animal to tell us what she's experiencing and what she needs. So given that my focus is on behavior, what we did was when the Dairy Innovation Hub first opened up some calls for applications for capital equipment, we decided to apply for this whole barn video recording system, which I'll explain in a moment. So this was funded in fiscal year 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic, which caused some challenges, but we managed to get it done. And it's been a really great resource. Dr. Doria just alluded to that. Um, and so he was my co-applicant on this grant. So why do we use video so heavily in animal behavior and welfare research? So set aside in your mind everything that Joao said about body condition score, and we're talking about behavior now. For animal behavior research, Observation by humans is still considered the gold, gold standard, particularly from video versus live observation. There are a number of advantages of video recording. So this manual annotation by trained observers allow us to quantify these behavioral outcomes in a rigorous manner. And so I'll talk more about how we do that in a minute. 
The advantage of video over live observation is that the footage is a permanent record, and so you can review it repeatedly, and that allows you to rigorously assess what we call observer reliability. So this is consistency between different observers as well as within the same person over time. So we want to make sure that we're doing this in an objective manner and holding ourselves to high standards. So we have various metrics that we use to calculate reliability. And we use what's called an ethogram, which is essentially a rubric and a definition for how we classify these behaviors. So it's not just about casual observations, say, I think this is what the cow is doing. We have very specific definitions of this competitive interaction begins when this specific body part touches another body part of a cow. Um, and we are not allowed to infer the animal's intent. We can only go by objective observation of what we see them doing. Another downside of live observation is that it's impossible to really observe animals continuously to the nearest second or finer scale, whereas with video, you can slow down, rewatch, and get things at a very fine-grained time resolution. So live observation actually also requires video for validation. And so what I mean by time sampling is oftentimes you have to make decisions where you're going to watch one animal or one pen of animals for just a snapshot in time or a brief um, segment of time and then you have to move on to the next animal or next pen and return. So that's time sampling. And in order to know if you're sampling frequently enough, you have to use video to watch at an every second or finer resolution to say, is it appropriate to determine whether an animal is eating by coming to the feed bunk every one hour? Probably not, because we know a meal lasts less than an hour. And as Dr. Doria talked about, um, there's opportunities for leveraging video footage to, to automatically analyze videos, um, but that also needs validation. So we need these video recordings to be manually annotated by human observers. There's other advantages as well that are just logistical, and so we can record the behavior of groups of animals and then annotate that later, which reduces the number of observers needed. So as I alluded to, when you're observing live, it's very hard to see what different animals are doing when they're housed in a group. Your attention can't really take in that whole scene, whereas you can get that with video recordings. And lastly, it allows leveraging of the data. So the same data set, the same set of images or video recordings can be used for several different purposes, whether that's other research projects, teaching, and there's also applications on private farms as well for personnel training and for farm management purposes. And actually, this equipment is being used for that purpose on um, other farms. Not, not this equipment that we bought, but this type of technology. So when we applied for this grant, we had a number of other PIs write letters of support because they were excited about the potential of this whole barn video system and what it could mean for research here at UW-Madison in the future. So Dr. Nigel Cook and I collaborate on some heat stress and ventilation projects, and he put it really well. So in the past, when he's done research that includes behavioral outcomes, um, they have had to use camera systems, and that's because there are various sensors that can be attached to the cows that supposedly give you data on behavior, but those are not very good for identifying the cow's location in the pen. So they can tell you things like, is the cow standing or lying? Are they ruminating but not where they're doing these things? And when we study heat stress, we often need to know, are they actually using heat abatement resources? We need to know where they are. So cameras allow us to do that. And then, as he pointed out, and many of us have experienced, um, the technology has come a long way, but depending on where you're doing this research, we often have to use temporary camera systems. And actually, this is still the case when we're conducting research on calves because they're housed outside, so we don't have a power source. We often have to use battery-powered cameras. And so we have this trade-off where we can either use hunting cameras, which have a long battery life, but they can only take a snapshot over certain time intervals, and it's low image resolution. Or we can use high resolution cameras like GoPros, but then they're constrained by battery life and we can only record for about an hour. There are temporary systems that you can wire indoors, but again, those have limitations, including data storage, and they require a great deal of setup and takedown. So having this new permanent whole barn system would save time and labor and allow us to get high resolution footage without these limitations of data storage and power. So I've experienced this myself. As I said, the technology has come a huge way, 
This is an image from my own PhD research at UC Davis. And this was about 10 years ago. And I don't know if you can see what's going on here, um, but it, it was extremely difficult to annotate these videos. And furthermore, I set up this camera system myself. And I think that I endangered the lives of not only myself, but also our lab manager by driving a scissor lift with minimal training and also relying on an undergrad who was willing to climb up like a monkey to places where he shouldn't. So it is dangerous to install these temporary systems. There's a huge need for a permanently installed system to, to save labor, but also I just wanted to give you a contrast to show you what the footage looked like when I did my PhD versus when my students are now doing theirs. So the camera system is installed at our Blaine Dairy Cattle Research Center in Arlington. So this is a freestyle facility that was built in 2008. It's still fairly state of the art and it houses over 400 milking cows in two connected barns here in an H shape. And so we worked with Jason Nosrati from Ag Video Surveillance in Beaverdam, Wisconsin, and he is fantastic. So he has experience installing surveillance systems for private dairies, and they use them for the purposes I outlined earlier, for general farm management and monitoring, as well as for employee training. So he had experience working in this dirty, complex environment and working very efficiently. He's just been fantastic, and actually ended up installing a similar system in our sheep research facility at Arlington which our colleague, Dr. Sarah Adcock, uses for behavior and welfare research on sheep. So we got 40 cameras installed across these two barns, and the footage is stored on this network video recorder with 24 terabytes of storage. So we are not really at risk of running out of space because we offload this onto our own private external hard drives. Um, from time to time, and we can also remotely monitor the cameras from the comfort of the office building. So this has really enabled us to do research that we wouldn't have been able to without this kind of system. So this is just an example, I think Dr. Doria showed this earlier, of what the screen view looks like. So hopefully you can see the difference between this footage and what I was using during my graduate research. So I'm going to start out by talking about a, um, some of the research done by one of my PhD students, Faith Reyes, and she is co-advised by Heather White and Kent Weigel. And she's interested in examining the relationships among the social interactions among cows at the feed bunk, as well as their production outcomes and feed efficiency. And so she's going to be doing three studies, so two are done. One is planned for next year. And so what she's interested in for her first two studies is looking at parity, so number of lactations, as a proxy for social rank, and how this affects the cow's eating behavior and interactions at the, at the feed bunk. And so she wants to evaluate how grouping cows based on parity, so either all permiparous cows together, all multiparous or permiparous mixed with multiparous, affects their social competition dynamics at the feed bunk as well as their feed efficiency. And so in her first study, she had 59 cows. There were supposed to be 60, but something happened. And so she had divided these into six groups, ideally of 10 each, and each group had access to five automated feed intake bins. So that was a ratio of two cows per one bin, but they had a choice of where to feed. So this is just an example of what the footage looked like. So you can see these markers above each bin, so that's what these numbers are. And then these patterns correspond to the group of bins that the cows were assigned to. So you can see this pattern over here at 21 repeats over here at 27. So one cow who's assigned to this bin can also choose to eat over there. And so what I wanna point out is that each of the cows has an individual marking on her to aid in this manual annotation. So there's a color, a letter, and a number associated with each cow. So having this type of technology really opened up new avenues of research because we intended to do this study, but we were going to rely on a temporary video recording system. And I think that would have made it really challenging because with 59 cows in the pen, that's a lot of individuals to identify and a lot of social interactions. And social interactions are a very difficult behavior to quantify without the aid of video. You need to do a lot of rewinding and slowing down to determine when did that interaction actually occur. 
So I think having this type of system, it's really amazing. Um, so she had the help of two trained undergrads who had experience observing other types of behavior. So that's Mackenzie Trinko and Christina Yu, who are pictured here. And so the data collection on the first study is now complete. They observed competitive interactions at the feed bunk over a few hours per day after feed was delivered and after the cows returned from milking because that's when feeding behavior tends to spike, especially competition because, again, it was a ratio of two cows per bin, so not all cows could eat at the same time. And what they were coding was specifically competitive interactions and this can happen in sort of a sequence, but ultimately what we're looking for is what we call replacements. So that means if cow A is eating, cow B can try to displace her away from that feeding bin and take her place. So that's a replacement. And part of the novelty of what she's looking at is she's also looking at unsuccessful attempts. So cow B attempts to replace cow A but isn't able to, and that has not been pre previously quantified in the literature. But of course, this is extremely time consuming, so we don't yet have a full picture of the results. So this is just another view, just illustrating how these cameras give us different angles at the bunk and allow us to identify cows if one camera angle doesn't show us exactly what they're doing. So I'm going to move on to one of the projects that my other PhD student, Kim Reuscher, was working on, along with um, Dr. Nigel Cook and Mario Mandaka, who got his PhD in biological systems engineering here. And in this specific study, what we wanted to do was evaluate how variable speed fans that are placed over the resting area affect cow behavior, specifically lying time or resting time, along with heat stress responses in production. And um, the reason for this is because we've seen in many, many studies over the years that when cows experience heat stress, one of their behavioral responses is to spend less time lying down because standing helps them dissipate heat. But this is bad news because resting time is extremely important for cows. And insufficient resting time is not only bad for their welfare in and of itself, it's also a risk factor for lameness. And I do want to give a special thank you to the staff at Blaine Dairy because this study happened during the beginning of COVID and it really, really couldn't have happened without them. They were super instrumental in the data collection. So this is not from a screenshot of our um, camera footage, but what I'm illustrating here is that the variable speed fans were placed at the end of a row of free stalls in our small pens. So the study that Faith was doing was in a larger pen that had 10 cameras. We also have these small research pens that can go down to a small, as a group of eight cows, so we can do replicated pen studies. Kim was using pens of 16, and she tested two pens at a time in a replicated crossover design, and there were three treatments. So we used a total of 128 cows. We had eight groups of 16 cows each, but again, we tested two groups concurrently each group got all three treatments, and then we moved on to another cohort of two groups. So in the control treatment, there was only natural airflow through this naturally ventilated barn. And so this was the average airspeed at what we consider cow's resting height, so half a meter off the ground. Then we turned the fans to 60% and 100% fan power through some pilot testing because we were trying to achieve a minimum airspeed based on some previous engineering papers and some practical experience, but this was the first study to ever quantify the effects of airspeed and line time directly. So with the fans at 60% and 100%, you can see the airspeeds were dramatically higher than when there was just natural ventilation. So what I'm presenting here is actually line behavior collected with accelerometers. So these are sensors attached to a hind leg of the cow and they record X, Y, and Z coordinates, and then there's an algorithm that then determines how much time the cow is spending standing up and lying down. And this is not um, a commercial device marketed for this purpose in cattle. It's also used in other species, and a lot of researchers use it because of the transparency. This algorithm is freely shared among the research community. It's not proprietary. And it was previously validated against, you guessed it, video observation over 10 years ago. So we consider these pretty reliable. And what these data are showing is that as daily maximum temperature humidity index increases, so this is an index that incorporates both air temperature and relative humidity, 
we see this pattern that's been replicated across studies. So cows with just natural airflow spend less time lying down as it gets hotter. And that's illustrated in the photo here below. So cows in this treatment didn't have the fans on. And I think about six out of the 16 cows were lying down, but the others were clustered around the water trough, which is a natural behavior that cows show when they're hot. In contrast, in both of the fan treatments, you can see now that relationship is flat. So lying time was maintained when cows had active high-speed air blown over them at resting height. And so you can see here, this picture on the right was taken in the other treatment pen a, a few, within a few minutes of this one. And so in this pen, 14 out of the 16 cows were lying down. So that's just illustrating this overall phenomenon. And this might seem obvious, but actually we were so, so excited because this is the first study to ever quantify the effects of high-speed air on lying time. And it's also the first time any type of heat abatement has restored lying time. So other methods of cooling cows lowers their body temperature, restores feed intake and milk production, but no other method has been shown to rescue lying time. So we're really, really excited about this. And so here is a view from the cameras that Kim is using in this study. And so you can see we get a view of the entire pen and what the cows are doing there. And this is just another angle. So we're able to see, are they using the water trough, which is shared between pens? Are they lying down, et cetera? Because again, we're not only interested in how much time they're spending lying down, but where they're lying. So are they actually clustering closer to the fans and those types of questions? So Kim is looking at behavioral inventory. So this is still underway with the help of an undergraduate named Brianna Wanick. And she's also looking at respiration rates, which are not a behavior per se, but they are um, a sensitive indicator of heat stress. It's a method that cows use to dissipate heat. And having this footage allows us to measure respiration rate visually. So she had two undergraduates who helped her with that, Amanda Jimenez and Kiara Tumasi. And Kiara is almost done analyzing all of that. And then Kim actually is going to use Faith's footage and leverage that to write an additional paper about subsampling for respiration rate, meaning if you have a large pen of cows, it's logistically infeasible to measure respiration rate on all of them in a live setting. So say a consultant wants to go to a dairy farm and assess the heat stress status of the herd, they don't have time to look at every single cow. So what's the right number of cows to look at? And Kim can do that by using Faith's footage. So that's another opportunity for leveraging. So you might have noticed that none of the data I presented was from the camera footage. And again, it's because it is extremely labor intensive. We still think it's the right way to do it for now because again, it's the gold standard. We hold ourselves to very high standards of inter-observer and intra-observer reliability. But the next frontier is what Dr. Doria presented. So uh, we really look forward to advancing these technologies for automated image analysis and computer vision because it will save us so much labor but first, of course, these technologies have to be validated so that we know they're picking up on the right behaviors. So some of what I'm going to present is just repeating what Joao already shared. These slides are from his lab. So we want to just acknowledge um, the members of his lab who are doing this kind of work. So towards the second half of his presentation, he gave an example of how they're using this specific camera system in their work for automated image analysis. So, to monitor cows' specific behaviors, such as resting, eating, et cetera, they can use time-lapse images. So what we use in my lab is um, continuous footage at several frames per second. But they can use these still images collected over time from these surveillance cameras and use deep learning models to create algorithms that automatically detect what the cows are doing and which cows are doing what. And so in this particular study, they created three categories for these basic behaviors. So resting, feeding, and everything else, which are based on these areas of the pen. So they're monitoring specific loci, meaning areas of the pen, to track how much time cows are spending in these three categories of resting, feeding, or other. So resting occurs in the lying stalls, feeding occurs at the feed bunk, and then everything else happens elsewhere. And so they use this hierarchical approach, which he discussed. So first, they propose a model that counts the number of cows resting, if that's the target behavior. So here are the cows that are lying down here in the stalls. They focus on a specific portion of the image, and then that's translated into this 1D signal. 
And then they use these signals that reflect the different number of cows doing that behavior. So four cows lying down looked like this, no cows lying down, or five. And that, again, relied on comparison to manual annotation by human observers in his lab. So they use that information to train a deep learning model that automatically then identifies cows who are in that resting state for that particular image. And as he mentioned earlier, if all the cows are doing the same thing, that saves a lot of time because, say, all the cows are at the feed bunk, we know they're standing. If all the cows are in the resting area, we infer that they're lying down. But if any cows are not doing the same thing, then the algorithm needs to identify that individual. And so these are just example images where you can see the majority of cows are lying down here in the resting stalls, but some of them are at the feed bunk. So then the algorithm identifies those individuals based on their coat pattern characteristics. And here's just another example, but with nighttime footage. And so we, we have the help of some infrared um, capabilities on the camera so that we can see at nighttime. You can see there's just one cow here at the feed bunk, so the algorithm needs to identify her. Everybody else is lying down, so we don't need to determine their IDs. We can infer that. And then to um, train the model, they used 2,200 randomly selected still frames from one week of recording. And then the human observers manually annotated the number of cows that were lying down in that region of the pen of interest. So most of those images were used for training the model, and then a subset were used for testing. So he showed this earlier. This is the confusion matrix that compares what's expected based on the manual annotation versus what the algorithm um, attributed to what the cows were doing. And so then you compare the agreements and the disagreements to come up with this figure of overall accuracy. So that's really promising. Um, and I think that researchers like myself right now who really rely on human labor are looking forward to being able to use these types of technology because it can really save us time. I think that it's going to be a long ways until we can use this for some of the finer grain behaviors. But once that we've already annotated those, researchers like Dr. Doria can then take that and develop these algorithms. So there's so much promise, and I'm so excited about it. So some of the other potential future uses, um, there are other researchers that wrote us letters of support, and I'm sure there are others out there now who we weren't in contact with at the time who would be used, interested in using this system. So Dr. Guilherme Rosa from our department has some collaborations with Dr. Doria, so he's also interested in identifying animals and this additional layer on that is traceability, so as animals move through their life cycles into different facilities. And so that could include using computer vision approaches to recognize animals based on their coat patterns. There are also other users interested in different research questions. So Drs. Milo Wiltbank and Laura Hernandez in our department are interested in using these cameras to monitor the time of calving. So we have cameras in the large pen with the automated feed intake bins, which Faith was using to look at social competition. We have cameras over the small pens, which Kim was using to look at the effects of these fans. But we also have cameras over the maternity pens and the fresh pens. So basically everywhere where research is done on adult cows on the farm. So they're interested in things like knowing the time of calving. And that way they can collect the physiological samples they need right away. For example, to understand the effects of hypocalcemia, evaluate the difficulty of the calving process. And it, it will al also allow them to add behavioral measures to their repertoire, which can improve their understanding of the effects of serotonin precursors, and also evaluate the effects of overcrowding on behavior and reproductive physiology. So I think having these cameras really opens up the potential to enhance this research by a number of different PIs. And as I mentioned earlier, there's also some other practical applications. So this is the reason that other dairy farms in the region are installing these kinds of surveillance systems. So in addition to monitoring the time of calving, that's actually one of the reasons why farms already use cameras. It can help with just general facility management to be able to see what's going on with the cows as well as the people interacting with them. And this can improve employee management and training. So on a lot of large farms, they do their own in-house training, and it is a good way to provide both positive and negative feedback. So I've heard of dairy managers who will take video clips, and they'll share these during team meetings to say, hey, look at the way this person handled the situation. This is really good. We want to emulate this and repeat this. 
or if a crisis happens, they can use it for debriefing to talk about what can we do better next time. So there are also practical non-research applications for this type of surveillance system. I do want to add as a caveat, we, we have these cameras on, but we are not recording. So the footage isn't saved and we don't focus on the human animal interactions without people's consent. So we're using this primarily for animal behavior. If we do have research topics in the future, because I am working on topics related to employee training, we obtain consent. We don't film people without their consent or use that for any purposes. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over and then I'd be happy to take questions later. Anything about Dr. Doria's research, I think he could probably explain better than I can. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Van Oss. So uh, now it's time for our final speaker. Uh, Dr. Billy Brown is a postdoctoral research associate in Heather White's lab. Uh, he, after com completing his previous degrees or his, his degrees at uh, K-State in Kansas and Michigan State, uh, Billy's work has focused on metabolic and inflammatory mechanisms of feed intake uh, regulation in, cows, in peripartum dairy cows. And uh, he's gonna talk to us today about predicting feed intake, so please. Excellent. Well, good afternoon, folks, and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak with you all today. Um, I'm really excited to share some of this data that we've developed uh, over this past year. I started my postdoc uh, in January, and we're on the cusp of uh, submitting a publication for this. Uh, but last year, as I was visiting with Heather about the possibility of uh, coming to work here at UW with her, uh, we had a long list of things that uh, we thought might be good to look at and, and want to evaluate a little bit, things that would push me to grow a little bit during my time here. And, um, finally, she said, well, do you want to do some modeling? And I thought, well, that's an odd question. I guess I can find uh, some UW sweatshirts and get a haircut and we'll go take some pictures and um, we'll, we'll jump into that. I don't know what that entails. So I get here and she says, all right, well, let's go develop some dry matter intake models. And I said, well, I have my work cut out for me then uh, to start to evaluate that. So um, a, a particular interest in this, we're looking at how we can develop models using uh, data streams that we already get from the dairy farm uh, using DHIA or Dairy Herd Improvement Association type things that uh, we have readily available to us um, and that we might be able to take to the next level. So as we think about dry matter intake, which is a fancy word for feed intake uh, in dairy cows, if we think about the actual farm setting itself, we really don't have a way in which we can measure that for an individual cow. We have a pen of cows. We can say that pen of cows is consuming X quantity of pounds of feed, but on an individual cow level, we just don't have that, that ability. But if we want to really quantify this, there could be some good opportunities for the farm. One of those could be financial. Um, more efficient cows um, could uh, save us dollars in terms of uh, feed input and, and milk output. But also at the same time, there could be environmental benefits. So the more efficient an animal is, uh, the less nitrogen or phosphorus she, she could be secreting uh, essentially as well. So we can't determine that feed efficiency on an individual cow level if we don't know how much she is actually consuming. So we really need a cheap and reliable way to do this. And so let's take a look um, at some of these methods that we might be able to use on a dairy farm to quantify feed intake. So here at UW on this uh, left-hand side here, uh, we've got this blue bunk that's called an Incentech bunk. Uh, Jennifer just showed a, a picture of those of the cows actually up eating at those bunks. And these are great. They electronically allow us to monitor how much the cow is eating, um, but they are costly. And so that's one of the downsides that we have to that. These are not uh, feasible on a, a dairy farm uh, that we have typically on a commercial dairy farm in Wisconsin, right? It's not something we're gonna implement. Alternatively, if we wanted to measure feed intake on a dairy cow, uh, we could use a tie stall setting. We have tie stalls here in Wisconsin, that occurs but they're limited, right? And so it's probably a, a very small number of animals within our state and national herd that are actually fed in this method. It is also very laborious to measure out that feed by hand uh, every day. So probably not realistic for most dairy farms in Wisconsin. And so then finally over here, uh, we have again that group of cows. Uh, they're all consuming that feed. Um, it's cheap to feed them that way, but who's eating what? You know, which of these cows is more efficient? We don't know because we can't measure it. So we really want to measure this. 
So other folks have really um, undertaken some efforts to uh, anticipate or predict dry matter intake in dairy cows. This is not a new effort. Um, folks have been doing this. This has been a part of the National Research Council effort for decades. Um, we try to get an idea of how much cows are going to eat based upon things like their milk production and their components or their body weight and their body condition score. Those are things that we have easy access to through our data streams on a dairy farm currently. Uh, we can do that. Some other folks uh, have used things like milk spectra, which is part of the analysis of that milk uh, with infrared systems. And um, that can give us an idea of the components of the milk. And then uh, Malia in our lab has used behavioral sensors as well uh, to uh, work on adding that to predictive models to help us understand what those cows are eating or if we can actually tell what they're eating. So all, in, all told, um, in some instances, up to 88% of that variation uh, in dry matter intake can be um, predicted using some of these inputs. So that's really impressive, um, and, and that's moving us in the right direction. But there's a caveat. Our caveat is that this data typically was averaged over a long period of time. We have cows on trial for 28, 42, 60 days somewhere along the, those lines. So if we think about uh, a dairy farm in the state of Wisconsin, um, you know, Bucky Badger Dairy Farm, whoever it is, uh, they're probably not gonna have the ability to go and measure body weight on a weekly basis and to take four milk samples per week like we do uh, here at the UW Dairy Farm. So that's uh, a lot of data to be trying to collect all at one point in time, and it's really intensive. So fortunately, there's um, some new opportunities for uh, data streams that we could begin to start harvesting uh, on the farm to help us add to these uh, previous models that have been conducted. One of those would be milk fatty acid profile. Um, and so the DHIA organizations are beginning to offer those as um, opportunities to uh, help farmers make management decisions about their animals. And so that's something that we could potentially include in this as well. Uh, but also another opportunity is predicted transmitting abilities. And nobody's really ever included those in these um, traditional dry matter intake uh, prediction models. But what is particularly interesting in this is that there's a new measurement called feed saved. This was released just last year and feed saved is essentially uh, a, a genetic estimate of that cow's predicted dry matter intake over a lactation. So if feed saved is 200 pounds um, for that cow, she's predicted to actually consume 200 pounds less feed over that lactation. She's saving us feed to get the same amount of milk production. And so we thought, well, maybe we could incorporate these into some of these models as well. So I guess that brings us to the question, can we easily combine accessible data that we have on farm with a DHIA milk sample and be able to accurately predict dry matter intake from just one point in time, not averaged over multiple days. So our objective was to develop dry matter intake predictions using point in time data with those cow descriptive factors that have previously been used by adding milk fatty acid profile and PTA for both production and efficiency. So for this study, uh, we, we have a unique situation here in that this, we have continuous feed efficiency trials uh, ongoing at our Arlington Research Station with the Ensign Tech bunks. So we have daily feed intake records for cows, um, uh, multiple studies per year, 60 cows per study. Uh, so we have a lot of records to choose from. So we had 369 individual observations. Uh, the cows were milked twice daily, but for the purpose of this study to mimic a DHIA sampling scheduling time uh, point, uh, we just used one 4 a.m. milking, and that was analyzed for macro components and also milk fatty acids. Uh, we were lucky enough to have both body weight and body condition score obtained on the same day or, or within one or two days uh, of that milk sample. And then, of course, we had PTA for both production and efficiency, and that was easy to obtain. So we use a process called multiple linear regression uh, to assess uh, our predictive ability here. And we'll discuss more about why this procedure is important uh, to our results later. We uh, did both forward and backwise step backward stepwise procedures to help us narrow down the candidate predictor variables that we, we wanted to include in these final models. And then we had some steps for validation uh, of these models to assess if, if they're actually applicable to other situations, including using an, an external data set. 
And then finally, we, we had some uh, ways that we can measure the success of these models, R squared, uh, concordance coalition, correlation coefficient, um, which is a measure of precision and accuracy of the model, root mean square error, and slope and mean biases. And, and I'll explain those a little bit more as we get to them in, in terms of what we want to see there. And so then we also tested different level, levels of the models. And the, the idea concept here is how can we offer farmers an a la carte of things that they could potentially use depending on the data streams they have available to them. So not every dairy farm is going to have body weight um, measurements, for example. Or not every farm is going to have those milk fatty acid um, analysis as a part of their milk sampling procedure. So how can they pick and choose from what they do have available to them uh, to be able to use for their own purposes on the farm? So this is a, a three of the models that we'll discuss today for the purpose of time. Uh, but our first model is model B, and that's basic, and so that's going to include the things that are in those traditional models based upon the NRC, the gold standard for intake prediction at this point in time. So milk yield, body weight, body condition score, things along those lines. We also uh, added fat yield, so Y stands for yield here, so fatty acid yields to model B. And then PE down here, BYPE, so we're essentially adding the production and efficiency PTA uh, to the basic model with fatty acid yields. So let's jump into some of our results really quickly. So uh, on our left-hand column here, we're going to have the model that we're looking at, the name of that model that we uh, just explained there in the previous slide, and then these model parameters or evaluation parameters up here uh, along each column. And so the arrow is pointing in the direction that we would like to see those numbers. Uh, up arrow means we want to see them higher, down arrow means we want a lower number. So for our basic model, which included milk yield and components, body weight, lactation, and days in milk, uh, we had a CCC of 0.71. So essentially, that's kind of telling us that the model explained about 71% of the variation in daily dry matter intake uh, for these animals. Um, so not too bad. This is kind of in, in the track or the path of, of those traditional NRC models that um, have been used to predict dry matter intake. So we're kind of on the right path, uh, but we just have one single day's worth of data versus data average over time. So this is actually kind of impressive that we were in, in that ballpark. When we added the fatty acid yield to that, uh, we increased our CCC to about 0.79. So we had a good jump in our accuracy of predicting that dry matter intake. So we were excited that there was something additional that we could be adding uh, that maybe hasn't been used, utilized extensively in other situations. And then finally, when we added production and efficiency PTA to that, we had another nice jump and kind of a surprising jump uh, to us, to be, to be honest. And a lot of that came from feed saved, as we'll see here in a little bit. But essentially explaining about 84% of the variation in, in dry matter intake. So um, a nice, nice prediction model. So what variables were included in that prediction model? Not everything that we offered to the program was included. Uh, it did drop some things that weren't significant, obviously. So this is a big hairy table of everything that was included uh, in that model. Um, so we have the different variables here and their parameter estimates or coefficients in the next column. So don't get overwhelmed by this, but there's a couple things that I want us to take home here. One of those is that fatty acids or, or specific fatty acids were really important uh, in these models. And, and for example, one of those or a couple of those would be preformed fatty acids and my boxes got off here a little bit and C18 fatty acids. So these are fatty acids, uh, preformed fatty acids are what we might consider to be mobilized from the cow's body fat uh, during negative energy balance. So let's say, for example, the day before that milk sample was obtained, she went off feed. Um, so she had to mobilize body fat to meet her energy requirements, requirements for milk. That would be reflected in that milk fatty acid profile. So this is kind of confirming what we know about the biology of the cow, and it's cool that this is um, portrayed in this model. Um, similarly, de novo fatty acids, those fatty acids that she's going to synthesize in uh, the mammary gland from, from the diet um, that she's consuming, was also significant in the model. And, and so this is kind of um, in, in relationship with those preformed fatty acids and in concert with that as well. And then finally, again, my box got off here, but um, feed save, the PTA for feed save down here at the bottom, uh, it was also significant. So 
Uh, this is really exciting to us that um, the, the work that's been done at UW over the last 10 years to identify feed efficient cows uh, is being pulled into this model uh, on, on such a short period of time, kind of reflecting how much that cow is gonna be eating. So this is great. Um, on paper, this looks fine. But what happens when we try to apply this to a different dairy farm? You know, it, does it apply to a, a farm outside of Wisconsin, for example? And so this uh, figure is looking at uh, our predicted versus observed uh, dry matter intake for our model training data set. So all the data that we use to generate this at UW. And these are the model evaluation parameters that we had uh, seen in a previous slide. But essentially, essentially, we're looking at our predicted dry matter intake on the x-axis and are observed on the y-axis, okay? So this is for our model training data set. We were able to get a data set from Iowa State University, who is a collaborator in feed efficiency. Um, and so they were collecting data in a very similar method that we are here at UW. So they had daily feed intakes, they were sending their milk samples to the same lab, so we don't have to worry about differences uh, between labs. Um, and they're weighing cows at the same time, et cetera, et cetera. So our CCC was maybe a little surprisingly uh, greater than our CCC for the model uh, training data set that we had, uh, but this really confirms that um, it, it is applicable to other dairy farms. And so part of the slope bias here that we see too might be coming from the ratio of um, first lactation cows to second lactation cows. In Iowa State, about two thirds of the data that they'd be on this lower end of the intake scale were first lactation whereas ours were, we only had about one third first lactation cows. So there could be some influence here that's playing a role. So how does this actually compare to our gold standard models we have available to us currently? Uh, these models such as the NRC that we use to predict um, dry matter intake and ration formulation, for example. Well, again, on the left-hand side, we saw this in the previous slide. This is our um, internal training data set. Uh, using our um, model that we just developed. And then over here on the right-hand side is the model for the 2001 NRC. This is about to be replaced, so uh, we're trying to move forward with this as quickly as possible. Um, but essentially, we see here that the, the accuracy of this was quite a bit less, and, but in line with uh, what has been published previously, in line with the data that's available and was available to the industry when these models were developed. Um, so we're, this is showing us that maybe we have an opportunity for some improvement over what has traditionally been available. So let's wrap up and do some summary and practical uses. Uh, I'm gonna wrap up with a summary first, so don't check out on me. We'll talk about the practical uses in, in the next slide. But essentially the inclusion of these cow uh, factors, a single milk sample with fatty acids, PTAs, um, they all help us to, de to develop a pretty robust dry matter intake prediction model. Um, and, and that caveat is that that's in mid-lactation dairy cows uh, where this data was generated. So that means that potentially milk fatty acids that are related to body fat mobilization could play a pretty nice role in understanding feed intake and predicting feed intake in postpartum cows and early lactation cows uh, that are experiencing high levels of uh, fat mobilization. Uh, so more work needs to be done in that area uh, to help for those adjustments in early lactation. And then finally, that the feed save PTA enhanced prediction models, again, as I mentioned before, is exciting. So one of the practical implications of this is that we use, again, multiple linear regression uh, for these prediction models. So that's providing data that's on a scale that's easy for us to understand. So from what I've been told, if we were to use an artificial neural network or something, something along those lines, it would not necessarily be as translatable uh, to a dairy farmer, say, if you wanted to pull that milk fatty acid analysis or whatever, it wouldn't come out in the, a scale that's easy for us to understand. I like to um, use the analogy that it's like we know how much our grocery bill is going to be, right? So if we go to the grocery store and they give us a receipt and they have log transformed our dollar value and multiplied it by 58, right? I don't know what that means. Um, and so we don't want to necessarily use that for these uh, feed intake prediction uh, variables. Um, and then again, we offer different combinations of factors to provide a la carte options for the dairy farmer, depending on what they have available to them. So what could we do for this? Well, we are interested in feed efficiency. Uh, there's a lot of effort around that here at UW. 
but on most dairy farms, how do we tell if a cow is feed efficient if we can't actually measure that feed intake? So we want to be able to accurately quantify that feed intake. So that could help us inform on the dairy farm pin moves. It could help us to inform management decisions based upon energy balance of the animal. When is she ready to go to a different pen, a less hot diet because she's getting later lactation, something along those lines. And then finally, it could also help us to select for breeding uh, decisions and selection decisions. So uh, if we have a cow that we know is less efficient, we have a cow uh, that we know, you know that efficiency marker is, is um, somewhat heritable and, and uh, translatable uh, to that animal, then maybe we want to um, breed our most efficient cows uh, for replacements and make other decisions for our other cows. And then as a nutritionist, I also look at this and say, hmm, so maybe this would be really useful for me to help with ration formulation. And I can be able to more accurately predict um, our, our nutrient needs of these cows versus um, kind of a, a group pen level um, feed need that we would have to formulate on. Uh, so I have to recognize uh, all these organizations, they helped to fund uh, the research projects that were utilized to, uh, to generate the data that we uh, were crunching as a part of this. And then also uh, I have to recognize the Dairy Innovation Hub. I am supported by the Dairy Innovation Hub as a part of my postdoc. Um, so I'm excited to see uh, kind of what everybody else has been working on as well. So um, thank you all for uh, tuning in to this. And, and I know we'll have some time for questions uh, here in a couple minutes and I'll be happy to entertain those. Yeah, uh, thank you, everyone. So if, if I may invite the, the speakers to go in front, please. So we're going to do like a panel, and uh, we're going to take questions from the audience here, as well as questions uh, from the live audience online. So uh, anyone who has a question to start the discussion, this is the time. OK, Ken has a Can I ask a question before I go to class? For sure. Joao and uh, Jennifer. So. Um, you talked about fixed point cameras and you talked about the uh, challenge with the calf hutches. Um, should we ask Heather for a camera system like at the stadium that's on a cable and <laughs> moves around and perhaps has a charging base on the post and calf comes out of the hutch and the camera can go over and see what it's doing? Should work, right? I mean, is that possible? Sorry. It should be work. It is now. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. This one is working. Yeah. So Jennifer is working more uh, with the cameras and the calves. So she, she will know the challenge much more. But from the analysis and from what we can measure, yeah, if we have cameras outside, we can. We're gonna have some limitations in terms of which behavior we'll be able to see, right? But number of visits outside, how long the animal stay outside, what the animal is doing outside, if it's lying outside, uh, if we have cameras out, we could possibly check some of those uh, behaviors. I, I think before I answer that, um, if there's anybody who is going to be a future reviewer for these capital equipment grants, I'm hoping to get a similar system installed at our Marshfield heifer rearing facility. Actually, I know Joao has some cameras in there, but I think a similar system would really expand our research capacity there because we have a lot of small pen replication as well. I think there's so much potential for more work on growing heifers. In terms of the calf hutches, it's actually extremely difficult to see inside the hutch, as Joao alluded to, so I love your idea of these NFL <laughs> zip line cameras or drone cameras. Um, but I'm not actually sure that that would address our question, but um, I like the idea. Absolutely, yeah. And, and there has been interest in using UAVs for that type of work as well, although, again, we're limited by battery life, but cool idea. Any other questions from the audience? I, I, can, I can pose a question to actually to the, the three speakers. Thanks for the talks, very interesting. Uh, I mean, more like a high level, maybe, maybe something that uh, probably uh, thinking in the future, like uh, five, 10 years from now. I mean, you are developing very interesting, uh, I mean, a dry mother intake model and a lot of camera and vision, computer vision to do 
behavior and, and welfare and analysis of, of animals. So if you think five, ten years from now, where do you think your research will go and what would be the dream that you will try to see based on that? Yeah, I'll start off with that. You can hear this and this is working? Okay. So I think our ultimate goal for this would be that uh, a DHIA organization uh, would be looking at this data, they have something to offer to their dairy farm. So when they get their monthly milk sample uh, taken at the farm, um, they kick back a report to those dairy farmers and, and here's your milk production, here's your fatty acids, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? So hopefully one of those things is that they also kick back uh, to the dairy farmer the feed efficiency um, or the feed intake of that cow. So we can actually have that record as a part of um, our dairy comp system as well, and, and that just becomes another management tool that uh, farmers are using on a daily basis. I have a lot of dreams about what I'd like to see in the next <laughs> five or ten years, but I guess related to the topic of cameras or image analysis, this is something that Dr. Doria and I talked a lot about when he interviewed because I think there's so much potential for taking these images and automating what it can capture in terms of animal behavior. So sensors became really popular in the last five or ten years, but I think there's a lot of limitations to doodads attached to the cow. You know, where does that end? And there's so much that can be done with computer vision instead. So actually we have some ongoing products where we're looking at basically this individual customization of what the data can tell you. So farms are already kind of working towards this, right? Like Victor, your own work with the dairy brain. But one of the applications would be sensing when an individual cow is in distress, either from a um, health condition or heat stress, for example, and then customizing the intervention. So either some sort of health treatment or heat stress abatement. But one of the things that we talked about that I think is really badly needed is actually that fifth area of my research and extension, which is on-farm welfare assessment. So not just for farmers, for their own management purposes, which is really critical, but also for providing quality assurance to our consumers. So we have programs right now that almost every single farm in the U.S. participates in, but this requires human observation. And as Dr. Doria mentioned, there is a lot of challenges for training all these different people to be consistent nationwide. And so I think if we have these technologies that actually are portable, so not what I was presenting with this permanent system, if there's a way to take you know, body condition monitoring or lameness monitoring and have the evaluator take that from farm to farm, it could save so much labor and be so much more precise because just like body condition, locomotion scoring is subjective and I think we can capture so much more valid biological information with computer vision. So abnormalities in a cow's gait when they're walking can tell us so much more when it's not just based on a one to five score. So that's what I would love to see. Yes, and uh, I think you know, when we, Jennifer started, I, I came a year uh, later, right? We didn't have the camera system. Um, in Mar at Marshfield now, we have 30 3D cameras, more than 220 animals. So if you put together the two facilities that we have, we don't have anything in US or maybe, I think, you know, across the globe, we won't find two facilities equipped with computer vision as we have here, generating the data that we're generating here. So I think the data brings us a lot of advantage to do things that we are discussing here. And I think what we, would like to see in 10 years is how we can enhance and improve even more what you're building now uh, to have other type of sensing technology, other type of cameras. We don't have thermal cameras in the facility. We don't have hyperspectral cameras. So there are so much uh, more data that can increase and, and improve what we have. And this, I think all of us, we agree that this attracts a lot of interest for other departments, other universities, a lot of collaboration because we have the data. We are able to do things that nobody is doing. So I think that's something I'd like to see moving forward is how we can equip the facility to be leading the area of livestock monitoring, you know, and, and then developing nutrition, repro, welfare, health, all, the, all those areas. Great, great, thanks. Uh, we're still open and we have, we have time for questions. I don't know if we have some questions from the live audience. Let's see if this works now. Is it working? No, no. not working yet. Uh, there, there is a question here. Okay. Oh, I think it's working now. Is it working? Can you guys no. hear me? Better. Uh, for Dr. Van Oss and Doria, 
Um, thinking about positive welfare on farms and with cows, maybe one of the things that we don't fully understand is the impact of um, social networks. So thinking specifically about like preferred social partners or the more colloquial term would be friends. We know that cows have preferred social partners and that social support can be really important for animals with the imaging technology, do you guys have the opportunity to look at um, cow networks or animals that spend time together and sort of those kinds of things? <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Kreisinger. I love that question, actually. So with the work that my PhD student, Faith Reyes, is doing, she is looking at these social relationships, but it's really specific to social competition at the feed bunk. She actually really wanted to look at other types of social behaviors elsewhere in the pen because the cameras allow us to see it, but because it's so labor intensive, we had to make some tough practical decisions. But I think that that would add so much value because cows can behave differently in different contexts, right? They can have these um, what we call agonistic or competitive behaviors at the feed bunk, they can have those also at the stalls, but then they have what we call these affiliative relationships where they groom each other or they lie close to each other. And so I think there is some potential, and Dr. Dory can confirm, with the data we already collected to start getting at a piece of that puzzle because we have coded these competitive contacts and then we can see, can we automate those? Can we identify the individuals involved? And, and social network analysis would definitely be part of that, and I, I think that would be super interesting. A common question I get actually is about pair-housed dairy calves. If they're raised in pairs or in small groups before weaning, what happens if they're regrouped later on in life? Does that cause social distress when they're then separated? And it would be very interesting to track that over time. I think that automating it would help a lot. Uh, just con confirm that from the analytical standpoint, yes, it would be possible to, to understand what the social interact is who is having contact with who, if there is a center animal that has contact to, to all the other animals. Um, yeah, so if you go in the, the literature of disease outbreaks and social interaction with, with captured by smartphones, I mean, you have a lot of good you know, indication on how to analyze the other animals. I think we just don't have a lot now because in the past we didn't have the capacity to collect that large scale temporal data, but now that we have, and you have expertise to understand the social aspect of it, so <laughs> then we can work on that too, yeah. Oh, here we have another question. You have a question for Joao. Uh, the, the seven days pre-calving is pretty impressive for predicting the, the metabolic disorders, but would it be possible to predict with data from 60 days pre-calving when you have much more time to implement measurement strategies that prevent the metabolic disorder rather than take action on that? Yes, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, and there is a, a, a very big implication in terms of management uh, decision, right? Um, well, that's something we want to advance. It's, it's how earlier we can go and how informative we, you know, the, the body shape of that cow 60 days in advance will, will we, what, what type of information this will give us in terms of modeling and predictive performance, we don't know that. That's something we want to keep it going because I agree with you. If we know that 30 days in advance, so then we can manipulate dietary uh, treatments and things that could change the course of the cow, right? Uh, and, uh, and for sure, if we can do that, someone is going to ask, can you predict one lactation in advance? And then, so I can, you know, um, so right now, I mean, with that seven days, it's, it's kind of a lot, but for implementing a management so what we would do, right, b nutritionally speaking, because you have uh, that you know, short period uh, to implement something. Uh, but we can do all the practice, for example, if I know the cow won't get sick, so maybe the cow can stay uh, a short period in the fresh pen and move to the uh, high-producing diet quicker, which is, that is not a nutritional strategy implemented, but a management strategy that will relieve and help management. So, for what we have right now, we can do, take actions, uh, but to implement some of the actions of change, changing diet pre and then you know, altering the route, so then we need to have that. Uh, but th this is a good uh, step moving forward uh, for our research. That's a good point. Do we have questions from the online audience? 
There is another question here. Grace. So my question is about the modeling, and I'm a food scientist, so I'm going to use the wrong terms the whole time. But you decided to go from above the cows um, to, to try to model that. But the pictures you showed beforehand was, were from the back of the cows. To, that's how they typically evaluate it. Did you try different camera angles to try to improve your model? Yeah. Yes, that's, that's a good point. Um, so all the images were top-down view, all from the back. Um, and, and so we try to combine, we, we can connect two cameras and take a snapshot all together so you can model, you can have a better 3D model of the, of the cow, of the thing we are trying to, to model. Um, the problem is the size of the data, it, it's morphing to install at the facility or at the farm, and these reduce our ability to, to increase the scale um, when you go to a, a operation. So that's why we decided to go with top-down. We know that if you connect two or three more, this will improve. We know that will improve. Uh, but we just don't want to go in this route because right now to transfer what you are transferring with one top-down view, it's a lot of data, a lot of data. So we have four cameras, but at Marshfield, we have 29. So right now, we just cannot transfer data to campus. There is no bandwidth, there is no way, because it's 13 terabytes of data every month, so there is no way you can transfer that amount. And if we put another camera in each pen, just to in increase my model, well, which is a good reason, but then it's impossible um, to, real, to do real-time monitoring. And we want to go more for the real-time, and then our idea now, how can we develop better models and overcome the problem of having one top-down view. At some point, this will still be the limitation, but right now I think we have more uh, to work around the modeling to improve that, and at some point say, oh, if I want to improve even more, then I need more cameras. But that's the reason, that's the rationale behind using a top-down view. Go ahead, please. I have a question for Bill, another high-demanding question. Uh, <laughs> so you show data, uh, using the DHIA, um, and you mentioned that in the experiment sometimes we average the, the period. Uh, so going back to the producer, is 30, every 30 days data enough uh, to predict dry matter intake or to do an accurate job from, the, from a production, stack, from a commercial standpoint, would we need more frequent DHIA data? And the second question is, if your model keeps uh, um, working better on the NRC when you go to later in lactation when there is no fat mobilization, so you don't have the contribution of the, of the long chain fatty acids that are mobilized. So uh, the first question was related to, uh, is this useful every 30 days or do we need to reduce our interval for DHI and milk sampling to every uh, two weeks or something like that, for example. Um, you know, I, I, if somebody can think of an, a reason or opportunity management-wise that um, that would be useful to a dairy farmer, I, I certainly think that um, that could be something that could be provided. In my mind, as I'm thinking about this from a feed efficiency standpoint, um, if, if we just want that dry matter intake prediction to be able to estimate the cow's feed efficiency, uh, and we know that an efficient cow is going to be efficient at any stage of lactation, then we might not need to pay for that extra uh, data but only once in early lactation or mid-lactation, her first lactation, for example. We might not need to do that on every single cow. Or, or maybe that's something that we do three times per lactation uh, when we know that she's starting to have differences in energy balance and we need to adjust to that, um, potentially make an adjustment to how we're feeding her or what pen she needs to go into. So I think there's a lot of different ways that we could um, s split this out, and it probably comes down to what, what do farmers want specifically to be able to use that data for. Um, and I think that's kind of like what these guys are doing up here. The sky's the limit, right? Where do you draw the line? Um, and, and what do you want to do with that? Um, and the second question, remind me of the second question. The, the second question was about the prediction capacity of the model when the cow is not in early lactation, so yeah. it's not mobilized, so, so you don't have the help of the fatty acid. 
a late lactation cow. So yeah, so these, these models were just developed in uh, those mid-lactation cows we've been running through the feed efficiency studies here. So, um, you know, I, I'm not sure how well I can extrapolate to that late lactation cow that's 250 or 300 days in milk. Um, I would not anticipate that it would um, be uh, necessarily a poor model during that time period, but I would really hesitate to use this for early lactation as it um, currently stands. I, I think we probably need to develop some adjustments for those early lactation cows, similar to how the NRC has an adjustment for early lactation cows uh, in their model by using an exponential mathematical thing that we won't go into today. But um, yeah, I, I think there's potential that we could develop this for different stages of lactation um, and, and really try to uh, predict what that is going to be at different stages, much like how we can predict um, the lactation curve of the cow based upon her milk production at any one point in time. I, I also have two questions for Billy, but I'm going to go one by one. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, the first one is uh, in, in a commercial setting, for example, I think this is a great development, by the way. The, 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 it's sorely needed, actually, in the industry, right? But uh, in a commercial farm, you do have, by pen, the whole consumption. Is that something you could use to adjust your prediction? Would that improve your prediction on a cow level? Because you, you predict each every cow, and if you aggregate at the pen level, you know how much they would be eating, but you actually have that amount. Yeah, so basically, could we add the pen level intake to the model as well um, and help help to increase the precision of our individual intakes. Uh, that's an interesting concept. Um, we could certainly try to do that at a certain level. Uh, one of the things that we had done um, also was looking at previous lactation uh, data, um, not necessarily feed intake, but just milk production in general, and that really did not perform very well at all. So, um, you know, that was a longer, longer term thing. So I don't know um, if that would add value, but it's certainly something that we could throw in there. Um, I was looking just yesterday at some feed in, feeding behavior uh, aspects, so time spent eating, um, things along those lines, if they added any value to a different model that I was trying to look at, and um, those things were a little bit more difficult to, to get any added value on. So I, I think the, the sky's the limit for what we want to add, um, but what we've also seen is that as we uh, we're looking at these models, we had a whole slew of candidate predictor variables, right? So usually body weight accounted for the most um, portion of the model, like 47%. And then every other thing that we added was maybe 2 to 3% um, adding for our R squared. And by the time we got to some of those later ones, it was 0.02% that it was adding to our model. So everything is very incremental, um, right. and, and so we just have to see. So uh, along those lines, the, this, the second question was about basically, and you gave a, a very good reason to use the multilinear regression for the analysis. But uh, would you think if you, I mean, and, and you know what are the factors that are impacting there, but uh, you could still use uh, machine learning methods and maybe it could improve your prediction power. So certainly, uh, those are useful. Uh, I know our lab has used those types of things in, in previous studies. For example, Malia Martin earlier this year published a paper uh, using um, different machine learning techniques and, and things along those lines, and they were really useful. Um, from what I understand from uh, Heather's perspective in, in previous situations, uh, going to a DHI organization and, and saying, okay, we have this, um, but um, it, it's not something that really is translatable uh, to a, a direct number on the farm. Um, it is really hard sell to those types of organizations and, and they just wanted something where they could plug and play those coefficients and, and get a, um, a dry matter intake value uh, that would, a farmer would understand. Thanks. So my question's for you, Joel. Uh, how do you approach um, computer vision and identifying individual animals of breeds that have less unique coat patterns? Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, I knew that was coming. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, we are, 
we are trying, we are, we are trying to address that problem. We are using uh, the shape. There are some uh, neural networks, some convolutional neural networks that receive, instead of a 2D input, the image, regular image, you can receive a 3D representation. It can be a point cloud, it can be a voxel. There are different types of 3D representations, and those neural networks receive that as the input, so then we can train that as a classifier to identify the class would be the animal ID, right? So we can use that and try, and try doing this. We have tried point cloud, voxels, and we, can, we are trying the death image, which is a 2D image, but then each pixel is the distance, right? Uh, so, and so it's a 2D convolutional network. And right now, this is performing better than using the 3D representation. And when you use the death image, you don't need the color. It's only the shape. Uh, so right now it's performing very well. We have 87, 89% accuracy to identify individuals uh, in a group of 40 animals. Um, but, and we evaluate short-term changes in body shape and how these affect the quality of the prediction because if the animal is growing, for example, if we work with calves, well, they can change the shape and then I am not, not able to identify them. Or the cows can mobilize fat and then if I'm using shape only, I can identify them. So with calves, we have a short term, it's like six weeks, uh, and we train using the first week and try to identify the animal the week six. They're growing very fast, even though it's short period, and we could identify them very well with six weeks. So our question now is how we, can we identify those animals a year uh, later or two years later? So how frequent do we need to retrain the network to be able to continue to identify them very well using the shape only? Uh, but definitely, it seems, based on our results right now, that the animal has a signature on shape, and even if they're more fat, or right? So if they gain weight or lose weight, the biometrics, the bones, they remain the same place with the same distance, uh, and that's probably what's helping to identify them even this six-week uh, uh, period, which is short, but we work with cats, so they grow relatively fast. So I'll kind of piggyback off of that. Um, obviously, the cameras probably don't have this capacity right now, but where do you see RFID playing into all of this um, inability to recognize an animal, as, as most dairy cattle already have some sort of RFID tag associated with them? Yes, this is a good point. Um, I think RFID will be for a long time, uh, especially because we can use RFID to tag the image and make the system more automa automa automated. Um, it, right now, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's very difficult uh, to do any identification using image analysis because we have a problem that's called an open set problem, which means I have a group of 50 cows. Next week could be 45, or could be 55. Let, you know, people move cows around the farm and pens. And so if you train a classifier to identify 60 animals, you have 60 class. And if I change the animal now, I have to retrain the the, the whole thing, right? So that, that's the limitation of that type of data, is how you, you make the system so smart that no matter how you move the animals, you'll be able to retrain and re recognize the animal um, that was changed or is there. And we see RFID as an important component to, as, to be part of the, the system given that type of issue. But look into the, the development of computer vision and how we have algorithms now that can not because right now if I train for 60 animals and I take, I put two animals there, what's going to happen is the algorithm won't tell I don't know these animals or not known. Will you assign a, a, some confidence to the most, the closest representation that you trained before, right? So if I have an animal all black and the animal you put there, it's kind of almost all black, that is just one white thing. We will tell that it, this is animal 32, 32 with high confidence, even though it's not the animal. It's assigned the score of the class to that closest animal. Right now, we have algorithms that can tell, I never saw that feature representation in my life. I don't know what it is, but I know it's not part of the data. So I think as those things advance, we'll be able to automate more uh, processes like that. But right now, is, is a challenge. So RFID will still be very important. And I think we will be because milk and powder is still using and all, you know, that, right? So we work with that too but we're just trying to advance a little by using the image as a way to identify. If I may, uh, I mean, uh, along that, those lines about the identification, for example, I mean, th there is uh, a great advancement, so what you're doing in your lab to identify the animals, and, and 
and follow the animals throughout the time, which is great. Uh, would it be much easier if the RFID tag would have an extra color or pattern, something that you can control on the animal that will remain there for the life of the animal that you can recognize with the camera without much uh, computer uh, processing Yeah, time. This, this is actually our dream right now. I mean, can we put something in the cow that the camera can see identify, like, yeah. uh, the information, the QR code, that then we don't have to train anything. Like, the right. camera is looking and, and seeing a the pattern, then we, yeah. So the QR code is difficult because, uh, you know, it, you have, we have a problem with occlusion uh, there. So how you will read that thing, that it should be something that is giving signal to the camera, and the camera is locating uh, the object and, and very accurate. So yeah, that, that would be the best. Um, that we just you know, very aware about technology that can locate with the accuracy that we need, you know, with the camera give us. I mean, we have the posture of the animal in the exact location, in the coordinate of the image, uh, but right now we have some things that we can locate the animal on the pen, uh, but not with that that accuracy, and that's why. But that would be that would be the ideal. But I, I have seen, for example, in in your research, you painted the animals. To, to well, yeah, yeah, Jennifer. So yeah, yeah. so can you use that as an identification marker at least while they are painted? Yes. So one thing we did, we were using a semi-supervised uh, learning. So we have that color code just to train. And then we start ingesting data, not paint, painted. The cows that doesn't have the don't have the the code with the color thing, and we keep it retrained. So with that, we could think about I paint the cow, and when that thing is gone, the model is trained already. Right. Right. So that's that's an approach they are using because they cannot code the animal through the whole thing because it's too much data. So they get a week, they code. And then this, after the, the, the paint is gone, so the model starts retraining with no call or no identification at all. But we have a small training set, gold standard, that we initiated the process. That's how, how we're doing some of this. Question over there. Interesting. If no one else has a question, I'll ask kind of like a, a future question. Um, thinking about cameras in deep learning in conjunction with human handling, one of the challenges that we see is that there are still willful acts of abuse on farms. I don't know how frequent or infrequent they are, but like a video was just released from a farm in British Columbia a couple of weeks ago. Um, are there opportunities for deep learning to monitor human behavior on farms or handler behavior on farms? <laughs> and to try to eliminate some of those behaviors? And if so, um, are there ethical concerns with collecting human behavioral data and its potential uses? <laughs> I think it's Jennifer. <laughs> I'm, I can't speak to the technological part, so maybe Dr. Dorea can, but I mean, Right now, farms are using camera systems for that purpose, but it requires human monitoring. So on some farms, it's done internally, so supervisors or managers will spot check, and it's, it's attempted to, to use the presence of cameras as a deterrent. So sometimes we know that people become kind of immune to the presence of cameras, and they'll still demonstrate these behaviors. Other times, people will actually work around the cameras. We actually don't have good figures on how common these behaviors are. Um, but there are also companies, not necessarily in the dairy industry, but in other food production sectors that use the third party like AeroSight for employee monitoring and training. And so there are humans that are constantly monitoring these videos looking for non-compliance, so not just willful mistreatment, but other areas of non-compliance with operating protocols. So again, that is done manually right now. I don't know if there is, there probably is potential. Um, but in terms of the ethical implications, these employees know that they're being monitored. And, and like I said, sometimes this still happens. In a research setting, yes, there's absolutely implications there because we're subject to public records requests. So any footage that's collected and is part of a research data set, we have to be really aware. So everybody at our research facilities knows when we're conducting a study that those cameras are on. We're not actively trying to monitor their behavior but they know that they could be seen on camera and that's, that's a warning to them. 
we are planning on doing some human and animal interaction research deliberately, but when we do that, there is a release form and a consent form that, that's signed. We don't film people without their permission when we're explicitly examining what they're doing. That being said, if we're collecting animal data and we happen to see people doing something wrong, this actually has happened. I've, I've filmed on private farms. The employees know that there are cameras up. We've seen things that are questionable and we do tell their supervisors. We send them the footage so they can decide how to handle that because I think on the ethical side, we want to make sure we're not filming people without their awareness, but if they're not doing the right thing by the animal, that's an ethical problem and that needs to be rectified too. No, I mean, I think she answered. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, there are potential. If, if you can visually identify the behavior and classify that, so potentially the, the algorithm will do that too. Unless something that is really hard to distinguish is that looks like a behavior, right, or uh, is that something different that just is very similar, the, the pose or the posture of the person. Um, it's just a matter of visually try to recognize and, and, and develop the analytics for that. I think it's, it's scratching this thing in my brain where I think that Aerosite actually has talked about some of this automated monitoring, but then it's flagged, right? So if, if there is this risk for a mistake that could be very grave where somebody's job is at risk or there could be an accusation against the whole farm, they could potentially lose their license to sell milk, it's still, human observation is still the gold standard. So if the algorithm thinks it sees a suspicious behavior, a human has to follow up and then investigate. So anytime there are these reports like this undercover video on the farm, there is a follow-up investigation either by law enforcement if it's escalated to that point or within the industry, for example, through the processor. So I think that that human follow-up is always needed to understand what's really happening. And what I also want to add is I think that the answer is really training, right? It's just like preventive care for health. It's not just about treating the symptom of these poor behaviors. It's about making sure they don't happen in the first place. And that's why I'm going in the direction with my research for, for training and understanding how we can improve not just skills, but also people's attitudes so that they have buy-in and put into practice what they're trained to do. Thank you. We are uh, actually over the time. Great discussion. Uh, let's give one more time hand to Joao, Jennifer, and Billy. Thank you. Great talks. Uh, thank you to you, the whole audience uh, present and on online. Uh, great discussion.